Hello. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to you all on this very special occasion where we hope to honour the work of the late Professor Graham Hugo, not only by reflecting on his contributions that he made to academia, to policy and to society over the past 40 years, but also by taking this chance to look forward and think about the foundations that Graham lay in terms of thinking and where that might take us. My name is Dr Helen Feast and I'm the Acting Director of the Australian Population and Migration Research Centre here at the University of Adelaide. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that tonight we meet on the traditional lands of the Ghana people. We respect their long and ongoing relationships with their land, their customs and their beliefs, which are just as important today as they have been for thousands of years. Uh, just before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping. If people could make sure that their mobile phones are on silent or switched off, please. Um, if you're looking for a bathroom later, they're located on either side of the foyer out the front. And uh, if you're looking for an exit, it's got a green sign. Um, now, I, um, the lecture will take approximately an hour and afterwards there will be an opportunity for networking over drinks and nibbles at the rear of the hall. We'd encourage you all to stay and share some of your, your memories and thoughts, not only about the lecture tonight, but also about Graham's legacy in terms of work over the years. I'd now like to call upon the Vice-Chancellor and President of the University of Adelaide, Professor Warren Bebbington, to say a few words about Professor Hugo and commence tonight's proceedings. Could you please welcome Professor Bebbington? Thank you, Helen. The Honourable Jay Wetherill, Premier of South Australia, family and friends of Graham Hugo, colleagues, guests, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this historic hall and to this memorial lecture celebrating the life and work of our greatly missed colleague, Professor Graham Hugo. At our graduation in this hall last month, we were very proud to be able to award a posthumous Doctor of Arts to Graham in recognition of his distinguished service to population research and also for his leadership role with national and international organisations. Graham had a very long association with this university. He was a graduate here, completed his Bachelor of Arts Honours here, and returned in 1991 as Professor of Geography. In recent years, he was Professorial Research Fellow in the Department of Geography, Environment and Population in the School of Social Sciences, as well as being Director of the Australian Population and Migrant Migration Research Centre. Geography was Graham's lifelong passion and his many hundreds of publications and substantial influence as a learned advisor were truly international. At the time of his passing, he was the world's leading scholar and expert on demographics and migrations around Southeast Asia, especially Indonesia and Australia. His work was commissioned by bodies such as the United Nations, and he served on many advisory boards and councils. Constantly on the move, he networked supremely across Australia and overseas. At the same time, he was a dedicated academic here, supervising over 70 higher degree research students to completion. A testament to his impact in this area is the great number of his former students who now hold senior academic and government positions across the world. Beyond the campus, he was also always eager to speak to school students, especially those from more disadvantaged regions, as he felt his own story of coming from a working class and working suburban family with no tradition of, uni of university education could inspire others to aim high. Graham was awarded numerous grants and awards, including being elected as a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia and an officer in the Order of Australia. He was also an invaluable, unique and modest colleague whose death deeply affected many here at the university who knew him personally and who'd worked with him. With his passing, his colleagues have continued to supervise his students, work on his ongoing projects, 
and complete his research publications where possible in order that his legacy would continue. To each of them, he was quite simply family, as we could see from the generations of scholars who attended his memorial service along with his family and hundreds of other mourners earlier this year. Graham Hugo is truly irreplaceable, but we're proud to be able to honour him in this way again tonight. And I'm now privileged to call upon the Premier of South Australia, the Honourable Jay Wetherill, to say a few words. Thank you, Professor. Uh, can I acknowledge uh, Dr. Alan Gamlin, today's inaugural Graham Hugo Memorial Lecturer, Professor Susan Kneebone and Associate Professor Alex Riley, and other members of the upcoming discussion panel, former colleagues and students of Graham Hugo, and most importantly, Graham's family, his partner, Sharon Stevens, his daughter, Justine Hugo, stepdaughters, Melissa Stevens and Emily Stevens, his brother, Malcolm Hugo, and nephew, Michael Hugo. I'm so sorry for your loss, and we're so proud to be here saying a few words to honour the late Professor Graham Hugo. Graham was a person of exceptional talent and insight. And I want to applaud the university for recognising his achievements and for building on his legacy by initiating this annual lecture series. I had enormous respect and admiration for Graham, as did my wife, Melissa Bailey, who was one of his students here at Adelaide. She delivered uh, a speech at the graduation ceremony in honour of Graham just a few weeks ago. And um, it's been widely observed that uh, the people of South Australia made the wrong choice uh, in uh, uh, their elected representative. Um, but I have fond memories of uh, Graham. Uh, I talked to him and read his research on a regular basis, especially in regards to social policy aspects of the ministerial portfolios that I've held over the years. I invited him to, to uh, join a number of advisory bodies, which he did. Uh, he supplied expert advice in relation to my responsibilities in local government, urban development, planning, housing, ageing, state development, and Treasury. My work in these portfolios, and indeed uh, the work of others in all of these areas of public policy, benefited greatly from his findings and perspectives. And while Graham clearly had a remarkable command of the technical tools of his area of expertise, what impressed me most, however, was his ability and determination to decipher the larger story, the human story that the data was telling us. It was this tray that I believe led ministers, parliamentarians and policy makers right around the nation and indeed around the world to seek him out, to rate his analysis so highly and to be attracted to him. Graham's last major piece of work was his 2014 publication called The Demographic Facts of Ageing in Australia. In that work, as in so many others, he was able to specify with a high degree of certainty the nature, scale and implications of a profound and prevailing demographic trend. Despite uh, what some observers might think, the task of government isn't particularly easy. It involves making choices. And it often makes choices that make people unhappy and raw opinions can often be expressed in strident terms. Governing at the moment is made particularly challenging by the rapid pace of economic and social change. And of course that causes fear. Places like South Australia are in the process of transforming itself from the old to the new economy. We're seeking to embed our state in a global economic system that's more interconnected and faster moving than ever. As part of that process, the nature of our neighbourhoods, the communities, the jobs we do, the industries we work in, the things we study, the things we teach our children are all in a state of flux. These have been the enduring concerns of Graham's work 
But it's in this environment, it's vital that policymakers and politicians have the facts and data to enable them to see clearly and then to engage in a considered discussion with the community to allow the community to move from that raw opinion, often expressed in very emotional terms, to a considered and wise public judgment. Graham's research on migration and population in particular have allowed us to do precisely this. And more generally, his work has fostered better informed discussion of demographic change in Australia and through that a more thoughtful debate about the nation's future. The State Government believes that Graham's professional and intellectual legacy is great and valuable. And so we wish to honour his life and perpetuate his field of study in a practical manner. I'm very pleased to announce this evening that my government and the University of Adelaide will establish the Graham Hugo Memorial Scholarship. The scholarship will be valued at $5,000 and aimed at students in the geography, population, policy or similar disciplines that align with Graham's work. The scholarship will include an internship with the Department of State Development. This engagement will involve students undertaking a piece of work that is of value to the South Australian Government and that counts towards their degree. A scholarship promises to be beneficial to everybody involved in it. And it follows from my announcement late last month of establishing a similar initiative honouring another former great of the University of Adelaide, the much revered economist Hugh Stretton. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's been a great privilege to be given the opportunity to say a few words about the man who helped broaden my thinking, but also helped assist our state to be a smarter state and indeed our nation to be a better informed and more considered nation. I want to thank and congratulate Dr. Alan Gamlin for being today's inaugural lecturer. And I look forward to both tonight's panel discussion and the beginning of the Graham Hugo Memorial Lectures. Thank you. Many thanks to the Honourable Jay Weatherall, the Premier of South Australia, and also to uh, Professor Warren Bebbington, the Vice-Chancellor of the University, for their considered contributions this evening. It now gives me great pleasure to in introduce to you our invited guest lecturer this evening, Dr. Alan Gamlin. Uh, if you'd like to come up, up gallant while I'm introducing you. Dr. Gamlin is a senior lecturer in human geography at the Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand and as a research associate at Oxford University where he is part of the International Migration Institute and the Centre on Migration Policy and Society, as well as a senior member of St Anthony's College. Alan heads the Diaspora's Engagement Policies Project as part of the Oxford Diaspora's Program and is the founding editor-in-chief of Migration Studies, a leading journal published by the Oxford University Press. Alan's research focuses on the geopolitics of international migration and he has a special interest in the governance of transnationalism and diasporas. Alan's lecture this evening is entitled An Inborn Restlessness, Migration and Exile in a Turbulent World. Can you please welcome Dr. Alan Gamlin. Thank you very much, Helen. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished colleagues, in New Zealand, my home, I'd begin by saying tihei modi ora, or tēnā koto. But here, uh, let me just say it's a pleasure to be a visitor here on Ghana land and a great honour to be commemorating Graham Hugo in this way, alongside those who are closest to him, his family, his colleagues. Uh, and so thank you very much to the hosts and organisers of this event uh, for the honour of, of bringing me here. I'm very humbled by it. Like many people here and around the world, I count Graham as a formative influence. And in honour of Graham, I'm going to talk briefly about migration uh, in the context of the global refugee crisis. And since we're in Benython Hall, seat of learning and philosophy, I wanted to begin with some excerpts from the Roman Stoic philosopher, Seneca, 
on the condition of exile. He wrote, look at this mass of people whom the huge buildings of Rome can scarcely hold. They have flocked together from the whole world, some brought by ambition, some by the obligation of public office, some by the love of liberal studies. Some have come to sell their beauty, others their eloquence. Ask each where he comes from, and you will see that most of them have left their own homes and come to a very great and beautiful city, which in a way can be said to belong to all. All of us here can relate to that. The obligation of public office, the love of liberal studies, the public shows. I'm afraid I'll have to leave the beauty and eloquence to others. But what a beautiful description of migration, written almost exactly 2,000 years ago, but no less relevant today. Seneca describes Rome, but he could equally be describing London, another city which conquered the known world, and as a consequence became known as the world in one city, where over 300 languages are spoken, or the New York borough of Queens, where almost half the population are foreign-born, Auckland, which is no less diverse, with 200 different ethnic groups comprising 40% of the population. Adelaide, too, is a cosmopolitan city that, in a way, belongs to all. And this public university is very much part of that diversity. But Seneca wasn't just showing us a similarity between the ancient world and the modern. He was also saying something about human nature. He went on. There is a sort of inborn restlessness in the human spirit and an urge to change one's abode, for man is endowed with a mind which is changeable and unsettled, nowhere at rest. It darts about and directs its thoughts to all places known and unknown, a wanderer which cannot endure repose and delights chiefly in novelty. This brings me to the first point I wanted to make tonight by paraphrasing something once said by Graham Hugo. Migration is an age-old pattern, not a crisis. But you would certainly be forgiven for thinking there is a crisis. More new borders through ancient migration routes are being built and barricaded than ever before between Hungary and Serbia, Ukraine and Russia, China and North Korea, the USA and Mexico. Political leaders are pandering to xenophobia, depicting migrants as a kind of plague. Dead children are washing up on the beaches of holiday resorts in Europe. Idyllic tropical islands in the Pacific are brimming with disgraceful tales of abuse in little Guantanamos for migrants. So there is a widespread sense of crisis surrounding cross-border migration, not unlike the crisis around cross-border finance in 2007 and 2008. And to be a migration scholar today feels a bit like my economist friend's uh, described feeling around the collapse of Lehman Brothers. If economists had lacked someone with the stature of a Ben Bernanke, they would understand how many migration scholars feel today without Graham Hugo. With the support of his colleagues here, Graham authored hundreds of publications covering almost every topic in migration studies. His knowledge and expertise could have helped through this crisis. But just think, an inborn restlessness in the human spirit and an urge to change one's abode Seneca wrote 2,000 years ago. So there's a puzzle that needs to be solved. What's this crisis today actually about? Global media have been agonizing over this question. More than 72,000 people recently petitioned the BBC to use the term refugee crisis, but it continues to use the term migrant crisis. The reason is that the United, Na the United Nations High Commissioner Ref for Refugees insists that refugees and migrants are, quote, fundamentally different, unquote. There are good reasons for insisting on this strict distinction, but also a perverse outcome, because it lets people say, before we help, 
we must make sure these are the bodies of real refugees instead of just migrants. And that brings me to the second point I wanted to make. The real issue here isn't how we label people. It's how to describe the crisis. Movement is the basic condition of humanity. It's not accurate or helpful to describe it as a crisis. The numbers of migrants as a proportion of the global population have remained relatively stable over the decades. On the other hand, there are more refugees than at any time since World War II. And it's quite clear that there is a crisis of the global refugee system for handling those flows. And so it's more accurate to speak of a global refugee crisis than a migration crisis or a migrant crisis. And today I want to make three brief points about the nature of that crisis. One about the drivers of migration. One about the, the uh, nature of borders, the contradictory nature of borders today and one about the quest for cooperation over migration. And each of these points, in different ways, connects with Graham Hugo's work. The first aspect of the refugee crisis that I want to highlight is that we have an increasingly wide range of forced migration drivers, including extreme poverty and environmental collapse, as well as global conflict. But we have an incredibly narrow legal definition of the term refugee, that it's quite far from the common sense understanding of that word. The global refugee regime recognizes the rights of people who move for political reasons, but not those who move for economic reasons, as if there were an absolute distinction between the two. In reality, political and economic drivers are difficult to separate because economic crises and political crises go hand in hand, as was the case with the Great Depression and World War II, as is currently the case with the Great Recession and the conflicts across Africa and West Asia. The current refugee system separates political and economic drivers so that during times of economic and political crisis, states cannot reject the most desperate exiles just by saying their labor is unneeded. That problem scuppered the Nansen passports, which were created to solve the refugee crisis following the 1917 Russian Revolution by giving refugees free movement, in effect allocating them to countries by labor market demand instead of by quota. In the New York Times, my fellow Migration Studies founding editor, Alex Betts, recently proposed a similar system of humanitarian visas Fine, but we should also recall that the Nansen system collapsed during the Great Depression and the slide into World War II as Western states with high unemployment did everything to prevent Germany's Jews from gaining asylum. The 1951 Refugee Convention was a way of guaranteeing at least one humanitarian escape route would remain open during future economic crises but as Thomas Piketty shows, global inequality has grown since then, and with it, the scale of human need that's crammed through this narrow exit. Relatedly, the refugee system assumes that political exiles need to move, whereas economic migrants just want to. But migration theory shows that to be a false dichotomy. For example, in the 1950s and 60s, Neoclassical economic theories portrayed economic migration as a rational decision made by free-choosing individuals with perfect information. But these theories were later discredited by, for example, historical structural theories saying that migrants have little information and little choice when recruited by big companies in rich, com in rich countries. So there's no absolute distinction between free and forced. One can be forced by economic need. Graham's co-authored work, Worlds in Motion, defined the terms of these debates in migration theory. But they're not easily resolved. Social science as a whole still res revolves around the question of whether human behavior is individually rational or socially scripted. Of course, we're both. As Seneca put it, Man is endowed with an inborn restlessness, a mind which is changeable 
and unsettled. To make matters more complex, both political and economic crises are increasingly intertwined with environmental crises, as was the case with the droughts in Syria, which pushed more unemployed young men to cities and fueled political unrest. Graham was well known for his work on environmental migration. He was revising an article for the topic on migration studies before he passed away. And in a warming world, this work has to continue, both to understand the relationship between environmental change and migration, and to evolve forms of global governance for forced migration flows that simply weren't thought to exist 70 years ago when the global refugee regime was formed to solve a unique set of post-World War II geopolitical crises. I'll come back to the issue of global governance later, but to finish my point about migration drivers, if we aren't allowed to call people risking their lives because they've got nothing to lose refugees, then we've almost defined the word refugee out of existence. And that long-term issue with the global refugee regime is central to the current crisis. The second aspect of that crisis that I want to highlight is the contradictory nature of borders today. Actually, there are two contradictions. One contradiction is between the legal right to apply for asylum in another country and the need to enter that country illegally in order to exercise that legal right. You're not allowed to apply for asylum from EU embassies close to the place where conflict has destroyed your home. You're not allowed to board a direct flight, which would take you straight to Germany for a couple of hundred euros. The only way to apply for asylum in Europe is to pay about a thousand euros and risk death crossing the Mediterranean in an overcrowded boat. And as governments target human smugglers and destroy those boats, your only route to asylum becomes more dangerous and more expensive. So it's a great contradiction that in order to exercise a legal right, you must break the law. The other contradiction about borders today is that they are very open to flows of finance and trade, but comparatively close to flows of people. On one hand, there is high youth unemployment in developing countries, and on the other hand, there are aging populations in the developed world. So employers want migrants, and migrants want to work, but they can't make a deal legally. As a result, they do so illegally. Graham Hugo wrote extensively about the practical difficulties of preventing irregular migration across Asian land borders under these circumstances. But the difficulties are also deeply political. Talking tough against migration appeals to both nationalist groups and to native workers who feel their wages threatened. But as Milton Friedman once said, immigration is good for business as long as it remains illegal. Because immigrants without rights are cheaper to hire. So migration scholar Stephen Castles has highlighted, for example, on immigration, politicians must meet conflicting demands from wings, different wings, within their own parties. The classic strategy, therefore, is to talk tough to appease anti-immigration groups while following up with unworkable policies to ensure that businesses keep getting the cheap migration that they need. This tactic is being modelled, of course, by the UK Conservative Party currently, where the Home Secretary has just renewed her government's promise to cut net migration to the tens of thousands, even though half of net migration is immigration, which can't be hindered. But consider this. The best political outcome for the UK government, faced with business on one hand, and with nationalist groups on the other, is not to meet their net migration target, but to fail heroically in trying. That's the way to keep everyone happy. It also diverts attention from debates about austerity. Migration becomes the scapegoat for social dislocation instead of deep social welfare cuts. So this political calculus helps to explain the success of slogans like one nation, across Europe, 
and the related global rise of anti-immigrant sentiment. My wider point is this, migration is old, but national borders are new. And so understanding today's crisis is partly about understanding the political construction of borders in today's world, which are very open to some global flows, but very close to others. The third aspect of this crisis that I want to highlight is a crisis of cooperation. The basis of the global refugee regime is that sharing responsibility for refugees both protects their human rights and also prevents them from becoming an irritant to further inflame current conflicts. This system stands in peril. More than half of Syria's population has been displaced, mostly within Syria itself. Almost all of those who have escaped are now in Lebanon, Turkey and Jordan, which are buckling under the strain. Around a quarter of the population of Lebanon, where I'll speak next month, are refugees. Some Westerners say that Arab oil states take too few refugees. It's rather simplistic. Officially, these states take zero migrants and zero refugees, because officially such people are called foreign workers or guests. But to give a sense of scale, over 80% of people in the United Arab Emirates are foreign workers or guests. As UNHCR notes, many are from refugee-producing countries. Some 250,000 Syrians live in the UAE. 100,000 of them have arrived since the conflict began in 2011. UNHCR counts 500,000 Syrians in Saudi Arabia, which officially refuses to boast about its hospitality, but has granted them full legal residence status, including free medical care, access to schools and universities, and permission to work. Yes, Gulf states could do more, but so could Western states further afield, especially as they, we, have few or fewer delicate sectarian divisions to manage. Why then is the focus all on Europe? Only around 300,000 Syrians have made it to Europe less than 2% of the total displaced population. But European states are in emergency mode and having trouble recognizing that it's both in their obligations and in their interests to share around this relatively small refugee population. They're saying, yes, we need a global refugee system, but not in my backyard. As Peter Sutherland, the UN's special representative on migration put it recently, if the EU resettles 20,000 refugees, a city the size of Vienna or Budapest would have to take 100 people. This is what the outrage is all about? So in this sense, we don't have a crisis of numbers. We have a crisis of cooperation. Where international cooper cooperation fails, there's a role for global governance. But migration has been called the missing global regime. The United Nations has boosted its efforts to cultivate cooperation over migration in the last decade, but many of its member states are wary of anything like a world migration organization. In lieu of such an outfit, the UN is encouraging bilateral and regional forms of responsibility sharing, such as sharing migrants' time by facilitating circular migration or sharing their skills through policies of diaspora engagement. Graham Hugo beat the drum for both these forms of international cooperation, bringing decades worth of evidence to support his vision of migration as a force for global development. With Graham gone, it's vital both that evidence and not anti-immigrant ideology continues to drive migration policy and also that the quest for cooperation continues. And that brings me to my final point, I've talked about three aspects of the global refugee crisis. Migration drivers, the contradictory nature of borders, and the quest for cooperation. In finishing, I'd like to speak briefly about the role of scholarship in understanding and solving these kinds of complex crises. In an open society, the academy plays a role akin to that of an independent judiciary, a free press, and a separate legislature. Engagement between scholarship and policy is therefore, by nature, a mix of cooperation and contestation, which can be devilishly difficult. Seneca, whom I mentioned earlier, was pilloried 
for advising and administering to the most infamous of Roman tyrants, Nero, who was said to have fiddled while Rome burned. Only in medieval times was Seneca rehabilitated as a source of moral wisdom and a moderating influence who brought good governance to Rome until Nero turned against him. As Seneca's example shows, surviving as a scholar in political society involves a delicate balancing act. Graham Hugo mastered that balancing act incredibly well. A doubly impressive feat for one who was working in such a controversial field as international migration. He was famous for talking to everyone and being everywhere. He too was a wanderer who fully un understood that inborn restlessness. He moderated the influence of many unreasonable governments around the world and his advice was sought not because policymakers thought he would say yes, but because they knew he did unflinching, rigorous, independent, interdisciplinary academic research. Losing a leader such as Graham is therefore a terrible blow, but he has left a legacy that migration scholars here in the Australian Population Migration Research Centre and around the world will no doubt continue to develop in new directions. I think that's what Graham would have wanted and that it's the best way to honour his memory. So thank you. Thank you very much. It's a lot of food for thought on international migration. And now we're just going to add to that food for thought by inviting our other panelists to come up to the stage and uh, be a part of the discussion as soon as I find my notes. <laughs> um, I'd like to invite to the stage Professor Susan Kneebone, uh, who is an alumni of the Adelaide University Law School uh, and is now professorial fellow at the Faculty of Law at the University of Melbourne and is the secretary of the International Association of Study of Forced Migration. In 2013, she established the Asia Pacific Forced Migration Network and her recent research funded by ARC grants focuses on issues around governance of forced migration issues in Southeast Asia. Joining her is Associate Professor Alex Riley, who is the Director of the Public Law and Policy Research Unit at the University of Adelaide. Alex is also a member of the Work and Employment Regulation Research Specialisation in the Adelaide School Law School and is also an Associate of the Australian Population and Migration Research Centre. Alex and teachers and researchers in migration law and policy, citizenship, constitutional law, legal theory, and indigenous legal issues. They're going to join Alan and we're going to ask them some hard questions. Um, I'd like to begin um, by asking Alan first, what you think good global governance of international migration might look like? It's a very difficult question. Um, the first thing that I would say is that states generally, dis generally agree on the need for international cooperation over international migration. They recognise that there is interdependence, that they uh, have sh some shared interests in this issue. The issue is that, uh, on the one hand, you have states quite reasonably not wanting to be bullied by anything like a world migration organisation and therefore resisting more global governance in that area, which may impinge on their sovereignty. And then on the other hand, at the international level, you have a, uh, a kind of bureaucratic turf war going on between various international organisations which are vying for centrality in uh, discourse around migration at the international level. So that's what stops cooperation from happening. Uh, having said that, there are a few options that people have discussed about which direction to go. And of course, there is the World Migration Organization option, having something for migration which, is, which would be similar to a kind of World Trade Organization or an IMF for global flows of people. Um, obviously, as I said, you know, there's a state resistance to that. On the other hand, uh, there's the fully sort of bilateral, bottom-up, state-led approach of encouraging states to 
cooperate directly over the migration flows that they share. But I think the most progress has probably been made on uh, cooperation at the regional level and regional uh, governance of international migration, which I know is something that Susan has, has talked and written about a lot. So it's over to me. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Fine. Thank you very much. Uh, fantastic lecture, and it's fantastic to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great moment for me. Um, this is a very hard question. I think that you know perhaps the answer should be th the question should be thrown back at the states to a large extent. I think that question of cooperation is really important, and I think if we look around the world today and see which system of cooperation is working best in the area of migration, it's no accident that is actually the anti-trafficking regime, which has actually got the most funding and the most commitment from states, and it's actually that anti-trafficking regime, which is a response to symptoms of migration, which is actually increasing the problem. It, the, the causes are not being addressed. I was at a UNHCR global consultation last December, and, and, and the discussion was all around um, how do we stop the smugglers, how do we stop human trafficking, which of course is a terrible problem in the context of migration, but as Alan points out in his talk, it's actually a problem which has been created to a very large extent by states not creating enough legal channels for migration. So although there are huge issues around the, um, the, the turf wars between different organisations and, and issues around UNHCR, which of course is, is a, a donor, a states, it depends on states for its donations, all those sorts of issues, I think really we should show, throw the problem back on governments and uh, tell them to get their acts together. Very good. Alex, I'm going to um, move on to another question for you. <laughs> In this world of global mobility, uh, is our understanding of citizenship being challenged and is that a problem? Uh, thanks, Helen. Yes, that's a, another good question. Um, I mean, citizenship provides us with a point of stability in the world. So we can travel around, have our passports in, the back, in our back pocket and uh, know that we can go home. So it gives us that, that point of connection. But there's a bit of a, a paradox because the more we travel, I think the more we feel we're citizens of the world at the same time. And the national boundary as the determinant of who is a member and who is not becomes less, uh, makes less sense. Uh, people have increasingly complex uh, associations and affiliations and memberships in the world. And often things like uh, a work community that crosses national boundaries or uh, an online internet community, uh, which doesn't make sense within a national sense, they, they're more important to people than their sense of citizenship in, in, a, in a national community. So I think there's a, a difficult question in the future of the extent to which states main, can maintain control of their borders. And the way we control our borders is by saying, well, you're a citizen and, and you're not. Uh, and it's been said that the last bastion of sovereignty, state sovereignty, is the control of the border, which is achieved through that designation of citizens and, and non-citizens. So I think absolutely our sense of citizenship is being challenged. Our understanding of citizenship going forward matters a lot because if states maintain strict border control, we're going to see an increasing incidence of illegal migration, illegal work, human trafficking. As Alan said, we create, we construct those things by, through creating a border. And we create, as Alan said, the crisis. Um, and I think if states loosen their control of the border on the other hand, which I think must inevitably be the way we're going to go, it's not known if this will lead to a, a huge increase in migration or whether, in fact, it won't make much difference at all. And that's hotly debated. If we, if we got rid of borders and we had open migration, what would happen? Um, and I think this is one of the great unknowns that I suspect we'll be leaving to the next generation to resolve. Mm. Does anybody, have, anybody else have anything to add? Just... Oh, sorry. It's really loud. <laughs> just, just to mention that statelessness is one of the, the big issues in the world. I mean, citizenship 
refers to the way that a nation designates a person, but we also have an international system whereby people are meant to have a nationality, which as one writer recently said is a way of um, filing each person in the international law system. And I think that one of the big issues around the world is that many people do lack a nationality, they lack citizenship. Uh, and statelessness is actually as big an issue uh, in numerically as is the refugee uh, problem and it's actually one of the issues which is under the mandate of the UNHCR. I think it's often forgotten that the UNHCR actually looks after not only refugees but stateless people and internally displaced persons. I agree. I think it's a, a fascinating question, a really, really fascinating area of research on the relationship between migration and, and citizenship. And the answer is clearly yes, that migration does change citizenship. You know, migration leaves citizens outside their state and non-citizens inside the territory of another state. Um, and so that places pressures on the meaning and the substance of citizenship. I think there are two key kinds of pressure that it places on citizenship. So if you think of, if you think of citizenship in terms of identity uh, on the one hand and uh, rights on the other, you know, kind of a legal status or an identity with an attached bundle of rights. Well, in the, in, in the identity terms, uh, migration uh, changes, we're seeing a change in citizenship as a result of migration where identity is being renationalized um, and re-ethnicized. So you can be a citizen in a sense of identity wherever you live in the world because you're part of the nation. So you can see more than half of the uh, member states of the United Nations, for example, now have a, some form of diaspora ministry, some kind of ministry that, or, or de government department that deals with the nationals living abroad, the nation living outside the state. So on the one hand, the identity related to citizenship is becoming re-ethnicized and globalized. But on the other hand, the substance of citizenship, the rights and entitlements involved, are becoming, I guess you could say, marketized, or some people might say neoliberalized, where your uh, access to uh, the benefits of being a member of society depends on your level of economic contribution, the extent to which you can demonstrate your participation in an economic sense, rather than in a kind of old school um, civic participation sense. So I think those are really interesting and important transformations in the nature of citizenship that happen as a result of international migration. Thank you. Um, and just to change tack a little bit, um, coming back to your, uh, your remarks, Alan, about uh, the refugee and understanding what a refugee is, do you think that our understanding of what a refugee is needs to change? <laughs> Who wants to start on that one? <laughs> Susan, you want to, I'm sure you've got something to say about refugees. <laughs> so, the refugee is a legal definition, but it also has a popular meaning. Uh, legally, a, a refugee is a person who is being persecuted by their state. And one of the problems is that the UNHCR Sorry, I can just go back one step. And so states are given the responsibility to determine whether people are refugees, but not all states have signed up to the Refugee Convention. And so the UNHCR has a broader mandate to look after groups of refugees. And so we have quite a confused concept of a refugee. The, the refugee is a person basically who is uh, outside their home, who's seeking asylum on the one hand, but on the other we have this very, very legal definition, which actually does include persons who are persecuted for reasons of social and economic disadvantage. So I think that we have to separate out somehow the idea of the individual refugee from those masses that we see fleeing across the Mediterranean, many of whom are in fact fleeing for a combination of reasons which Alex Betts has, has termed as um, survival migration. So to prove individual persecution in those cases might be very difficult, but not impossible. And, but on the other hand, policymakers cling to this very narrow concept of a refugee for their own purposes. They use the distinction between refugees and other categories to, to, to come to the lowest common denominator and to impose restrictive measures, essentially. Yeah, 
Shall I get it? Uh, I, I agree with that. Uh, These I are the lawyers. The, <laughs> the, one of the problems is that we are, we are stuck with a, a definition for refugee that made sense maybe historically, uh, but, but the world changes and the, and the nature of the, the refugee crisis changes. Uh, and boy, we're only just seeing the beginning of that. With, with climate change, we're going to see a huge other population of people in need. And ultimately, it's got to be, uh, you can have a, a legal definition of uh, political persecution and all sorts of things, and people might not satisfy that, but that doesn't mean they're not in need. And so we, we, we have to, ultimately, we are going to have to sort of rethink the idea of a refugee. And going back to what Alan said as well, I think this, this distinction between people being in need or being economic migrants uh, is, is, is so damaging as a distinction. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we need to remember that, in fact, in some circumstances, uh, being not, allowed, not being enabled to earn an income because of your uh, religion or uh, for some other reason can, in fact, make you a refugee. So mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not at all distinct. Um, and, and I think we need to, at some point, uh, the, the world does have to step back and go, we've created a, a concept, we're channeling everyone through that concept, but it's an inadequate concept. Mm -hmm. no, I would agree. Um, I should say that, you know, I think there are very good reasons for keeping the tight legal definition of a refugee that we currently have, and one of the biggest ones that's cited most often is that if we tried to negotiate a new convention, we probably wouldn't end up with one as good. The protections that we provide for people uh, through that kind of convention wouldn't be as good as the protections that we provide through the current solution. So there are really good reasons for you know, sticking to the knitting of the current definition. But I think there are also clearly equally good reasons for hoping for a world, at least, in which the meaning of this old term refugee, in legal terms, fits with that common sense meaning. Mm. How that happens is, of course, another question. <laughs> Maybe one that we kick down, the, uh, mm. another can that we kick down the road to future generations. Hopefully. I won't ask you how that's <laughs> going to happen. <laughs> um, I just, just to uh, wind up the discussion and bring it back a full circle to where we began and reflect perhaps on, on Graham's work. Um, in this, particularly in this area of migration. Uh, for many people here in the audience, they know Graham through uh, a breadth of other fields, but uh, tonight we thought we'd focus on migration. I was just wondering if the, the three of you would mind sharing some of your personal reflections on the legacy of Graham's work to what you do now. Well, speaking personally, um, you know, Graham was an inspiration for my PhD. Um, he, uh, you know, reading his work, uh, particularly on the Australian diaspora, and just the way that he conceived that as a new kind of policy issue, um, inspired me to think about uh, what I wanted to do with my life, um, and helped sort of set the conceptual foundations for much of the work I've done since, much, much of the research that I've done since. Uh, in practical terms, you know, I almost ended up being a postgraduate student here in Adelaide. Graham you know, secured me a scholarship to come here. He was very kind, very gracious, and he was very supportive, not at all sour, when I, I chose to go to the UK on a different scholarship. Um, and he remained supportive and in touch um, over the years in a way that has helped shape my career. Um, so his work on uh, migration and development and diasporas um, has really shaped the way that I think about those issues. I'm sure there are many people who could say the same thing. Mm. Oxford's a very excellent second choice. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nice to be back here tonight. <laughs> In my case, Graham was a tremendous supporter and a tremendous colleague and, and just so good at exuding enthusiasm and introducing me to networks and I'm sure he probably helped me get quite a few grants behind the scenes but it was particularly his work on Southeast Asia because you know I'm a lawyer by training but I've done an MA in Asian studies and lived in Asia and my, my passion is this, this, this area of forced migration uh, and, and Graham was just incredibly helpful and, and inspirational um, 
and, and, and just always there when I needed him. So he was wonderful. I mean, his, his work on uh, Indonesia is, is fascinating. I was rereading some of it um, recently. And the fact that he worked for so many people, he, could, he straddled so many uh, different um, sectors too. Mm -hmm. Just an amazing man. Mm. And I, um, I approached Graham when I first came back to Adelaide with a paper I wrote and uh, out of the blue, I, I knew there was this giant in the, in the university and so I I'd, I'd sort of sent him an email with my paper attached and didn't know what was going to happen but I, I got an email back saying um, come into my office and, and we'll have a, have a discussion. And so I went up to the geography department, found his office, walked in and there was just these piles of paper, <laughs> massive piles and I, I sort of found him hidden in his desk somewhere behind those piles and he was incredibly generous with his discussion of my paper and but also just immediately managed to sort of say, well look, that's, that's, really, that's a really interesting way you've decided to talk about the exploitation of labour migration what about this perspective and what about this perspective? And he just put it into such a, a much broader frame and, and I've uh, benefited in the, in the years since for, from his ability to do that. Um, so his, both his breadth of knowledge, his scope of vision, but also probably more important, uh, most important of all is his compassion. Mm. He always, whenever you were talking about migration, it came back to the human being mm. and that was very inspiring. Mm. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank all our speakers this evening for sharing their thoughts and their uh, ideas. If you could put your hands together. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Thank you. You don't get one. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> That's right. Nice. Thank you. I didn't want to drop one. And now I'd like to call upon Professor Jenny Shaw, the Dean of the Faculty of Arts here at the University of Adelaide, to close night's, tonight's memorial lecture. Could you please welcome Professor Shaw to the stage? Thanks, Helen. Uh, thank you again to our panel. I'm sure that Dr. Alan Gamlin, Professor Susan Kneebone, Associate Professor Alex Rowley and Helen We'll be happy to talk with you further over refreshments in a few moments. This memorial lecture has been held to honour Professor Graham Hugo, remembered by many of you here as a valued colleague, advisor and mentor, and much loved friend and family member. This has been one of several events held this year around the world that have acknowledged and celebrated the significant contributions of Professor Graham Hugo to demography and migration research. Graham's influence is, of course, international, as we've heard, but at its core was his beloved Adelaide, his family and his friends and his colleagues. His influence was and is especially strong here at the University of Adelaide and will continue through the influential work of his colleagues and students now spread over the globe, um, if you like, a Hugo diaspora. The generous and exciting new Graham Hugo Memorial Scholarship announced this evening by our Premier, the Honourable Jay Wetherill, will also attract the best and brightest to this critically important field. And Graham, as we all know, was a, a truly distinguished researcher, but he was also an outstanding teacher, much and a much awarded teacher of geography. And he would have been thrilled. Thank you, Premier. We might have retained you, Alan, had we had such a scholarship. Demography and migration studies will continue to drive social, political and economic thinking and decision making. And much of the centrality of these studies for our current policy and decision makers in this state and across Australia is thanks to Graham. Graham established a bedrock for demography and migration studies here at the University of Adelaide through the Australian Population and Migration Research Centre and his beloved Geography, Environment and Population Department in the School of Social Sciences. The centre, school, faculty of arts and wider university community are committed to the continuation, development and expansion of Graham's valuable legacy. Thank you again to our elder conservatory musicians who've now gone home, but you enjoyed their, their performance earlier this evening. <laughs> 
Thank you to our Premier, to our Vice-Chancellor, and to all our speakers this evening. I'd also like to thank uh, the School of Social Sciences, uh, the Head of School, Associate Professor Susan Oakley, and the Faculty Office staff who initiated and put together this event. So we'd now like you to uh, share your own memories of Graham over refreshments at the rear of this beautiful hall. Thank you for joining us this evening, and I hope we will see you again next year at the second Graham Hugo Memorial Lecture. Thank you.